I read your questions. I'll ask you off camera now. Have you ever had any failures? Have I had any failures? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Because that's usually what uh, when you talk to entrepreneurs. people on here that have done extraordinary things this in his office and then the other ones we also have 18 we did the same thing we had the are real paintings it's not real painting it's not a oh good okay I'll ask you about that too later we Alright, before we get uh, completely moving here, I don't want to mispronounce it's, is it Emotech? Emotech. Emotech, okay. All right, hey everybody, it's Mayor Jane here for our weekly Facebook Live. Uh, very excited to be here today. Thank you again for taking time out of your busy day to tune in and see what is happening here in the Tampa Bay area. We like to keep you up on uh, everything that's happening with uh, COVID-19. But today we have an incredible guest with us who is the CEO of Emertech, uh, and it is Eric. Maltese. And we thank you so much for being here today. This, actually yesterday, was the beginning of Hispanic Heritage Month. And so we will be highlighting and celebrating our Hispanic heritage here in Tampa and highlighting those individuals that really have made our city what it is today. And also a lot of uh, the current younger uh, Hispanics that are, are really lifting up uh, Tampa. So we're very excited to get to Eric and hear um, a lot of wonderful stories about his company, but about some other things too. So can't wait to get to that. But first, let's talk about COVID-19 and the state of Florida, Hillsborough County. Uh, there are 668,846 positive cases of coronavirus in the uh, state of Florida. Uh, confirmed cases, uh, let's see, confirmed cases just in Hillsborough County, 23,472. City of, of Tampa and Hillsborough County, we have 591 deaths from COVID-19, 591. Uh, I remember when, when we were in double digits and really that in and of itself was unbelievable. And now we're over uh, 500 reaching 600 deaths. So this continues to be a very deadly pandemic uh, in the scheme of things. A lot of people say, you know, the, the uh, population that we have, that um, 591 deaths uh, are not a lot. But, uh, you know, if each of those numbers represents an individual, and that could be your loved one, your friend, your neighbor, so we work hard every single day to reduce those number of positive cases and then ultimately reduce the number of deaths. So it is critically important um, that we all continue to do our part 
and uh, to take our responsibility very, very seriously. Um, the seven day average for cases in Hillsborough County is 160 cases. Our positivity rate still remains just under 6%. It's actually gone up just a little bit. It's 5.96%, which is in the scheme of things is, is good. But uh, we also have a reduction in the number of tests being given. So again, we encourage everyone to go out and uh, get your COVID-19 test. Clearly, if you have any symptoms, but uh, if, um, you know, if you have been around, you've been exposed to anyone, go and get that test. I know a number of people that uh, would not have even known they had COVID-19 had they not had the test. It's critically important as well. If you have, if you're a caregiver uh, for someone who has a comorbidity uh, or is, is uh, elderly. So make sure that we're taking advantage of the tests that are now available. We, in the city of Tampa, we've got uh, Raymond James Stadium and Lee Davis Center over in East Tampa, clearly Raymond James over in West Tampa, MLK and uh, North Del Mabry. And literally you can get a test anywhere in Hillsborough County, seven days a week. You go on to our website, tampagov.net, uh, or go to Hillsborough County site and you'll be able to see all the testing locations. You'll also be able to get up to date on all the information associated uh, with COVID-19. You can see what the um, relief programs are, the CARES Act funding that uh, was received by Hillsborough County and they're distributing that. You can see uh, relief money for individuals, for businesses. So anything and everything that you need to know about COVID-19 is there, but uh, the precautions remain the same. Please wear your mask at all time when you can't uh, social distance and you're indoors. Make sure that you're washing your hands and you're sanitizing surfaces. Very, very important. Although these cases, we've been very successful in bringing the number of positive cases down, Again, it's a, still a very dangerous a pandemic and we need to continue wearing masks until uh, we have reached the herd immunity, which isn't going to happen or a vaccine uh, is brought forward. There's some talk in some of the other counties about relaxing the mask ordinance. I don't even know what that means, but you should wear a mask. It's your personal responsibility and the way to keep yourself safe and to keep those around you uh, safe as well. So we need to stick with that. It's very important. We still don't have um, the uh, number of cases. We haven't been able to see the effect of opening up the schools. That will probably be around the beginning of next week. We'll start to see those cases uh, rise up. Um, in talking to the superintendent of Hillsborough County Schools, Addison Davis, doing a great job keeping those facilities safe and uh, uh, sanitized, but there's still going to be cases that will arise. We just have to make sure we keep those to a minimum. The governor has opened up bars to half capacity. And um, frankly, some of the bars were violating the order before it even went into effect. So again, the bar owners have to be uh, responsible and also the patrons. You, you have to know that going to the bars without a mask, you know, standing, um, you know, close to other individuals without a mask, talking loud over the music and everything else is going to result in the same spike we saw the last time that the bars were open. I have, have encouraged using CARES money to uh, uh, subsidize the uh, bar owners because I know everyone is hurting and, and they're looking at uh, the possibility of losing a business that they may have worked their entire life to build up. So I understand the economic impact to uh, the bars. However, I also understand that um, that is a recipe for the spread of COVID-19 if you're not following the rules. Everybody's sitting down and everybody wearing uh, masks whenever possible. All right, enough of my uh, my lecturing as a mom, but it, it is, it's critically important. We all have to continue to do our part to try to keep this virus in check. 
It's very important. Okay, all right. This is very exciting. As I said yesterday, started um, Hispanic Heritage Month, which we will be celebrating every single day from September 15th to October 15th, and frankly, every other day of the year, because we have a, a very large uh, Hispanic population in our community. It is currently uh, stated as 20%, but you and I know that uh, the uh, number of, of Hispanics, Latinos and Latinas that live in our community is much, much higher than that. We had a uh, great ceremony yesterday, although it was a sad occasion. It was a 70th anniversary of the death of Baldomaro Perez, who was a Marine, Lut I'm sorry, Lopez, who was a Marine Lieutenant in, um, was in uh, the Korean War, and he led his, uh, his squad into battle and actually took out himself with a grenade, took out one portion of the enemy and was getting ready to throw a grenade into another area where the enemy was at when he was shot and mortally wounded. He dropped that hand grenade and he yelled to the rest of, of his a platoon to get back and then he rolled on top of that hand grenade basically sacrificing his life to preserve the lives of those individuals uh, that he led so a true example of leadership and uh, we celebrate his memory and all that he and every other member of the military uh, do to preserve the rights that that we have here in the greatest nation in the world so here is to uh, Baldomero Lopez and his family as well. We had his nephew at the event yesterday. So very, very exciting. We also celebrate all that has been done, uh, you know, by the work, uh, you know, the, the, the things that we enjoy, the culture, the uh, entertainment, the food, uh, the art, everything that that uh, our Hispanic brothers and sisters uh, bring to our community, going back to way before Ybor City and the cigar industry was founded. So very exciting stuff. And today we get to highlight Eric, who is an incredible uh, member of our community. So let me read a little bit about him before we get into the uh, questions. From an early age, Eric was guided by two things, to make an impact in the world as an entrepreneur and to serve others. He started his first business at 14 years old, I love that, and loved entrepreneurship ever since. Following high school, Eric's calling to serve inspired him to join the U.S. Marine Corps. Uh, he spent one uh, year in Iraq, excuse me? I said hoorah. Hoorah, that's right. And you know what, <laughs> about tomorrow, although he went to the Naval Academy, he actually was a Marine, so yeah. there you go. So uh, he spent one year in Iraq and then was uh, selected to serve at the Marine Embassy uh, security duty. After his tenure in the Marine Corps, Eric returned to Florida to finish his education. During this time, his entrepreneurial calling arose once again. With only a few thousand dollars to fund his idea, he founded an e-commerce business. Within three years, the business grew to revenue levels of seven figures. Soon after, John Clegg and Eric decided to focus on bringing their next idea to life, Ameritech. This year, Ameritech reached remarkable milestones. Earlier in 2019, Eric represented his team at Revolution's Rise of the Rest Seed Fund pitch uh, competition led by AOL co-founder Steve Cash. Here they beat out seven other companies to win a $100,000 investment from the Rise of the Rest Seed Fund. That's such a cool competition. It's so exciting to, to watch the, uh, the different presentations. Additionally, they secured first place at Thai Econ, where were selected as Tampa Bay Inno on Fire winners and were nominated as second place winner for Startup of the Year. On top of all this, Ameritech is expanding its team just last year, they were a team of three. Now they're 20 strong and counting. As Ameritech's chief executive officer, Eric gets to satisfy both of his callings and live out his passion every day. He serves a highly talented team of employees and gets the opportunity 
to build an organization that hopes to change the way physicians are trained. So welcome, Eric. We're so glad to have you here. All right, before we got on, uh, went live here, Eric and I were talking. So a couple things that I want to ask him about. First and foremost, tell us about the painting behind you. Yeah, this painting's really special to us. A lot of people, you know, in Zoom, you can change your background. You can have a digital. This is not digital. This was Carlos Pons is a is a um, a Mexican American artist who has dedicated his life to to do murals like this, and he does the ones that we we see in Seminole Heights. We hired him to come into our company, and one of the important things for me is that we're a software company, but we're solving a healthcare problem. And so we wanted to get all of our team together and. Uh, Build out my, the idea was to build out collages and do research and learn about history. This wall is the wall in our boardroom, and the the muse or the the sentence for this room is I was is women's impact on health there because I come from you know a single Peruvian mother worked really hard to 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 help me become who I am, and I'm very grateful for that. And so they chose the the different people highlighted here. You have um, uh, you have uh, if you see right on my shoulder, I'm trying to look over my shoulder, but you got Emma J Jamison's was the first um, uh, African American in space. And she's also a physician herself. Claire Barton started the right um, uh, for, uh, first at the sorry, Red Cross. And then you have um, Abigail, uh, Florence Nightingale, who was the basically started nursing and, and was a founder of healthcare just in general. So um, really extraordinary people that are highlighted and anyone who comes into our office gets to to learn about them and, and see that what we care about. All right. All right. Very good. Now, before we get into Emertech and and what you do there and and how successful it is, um, let's talk about what a lot of I, that I hear entrepreneurs talk about and um, in a lot of cases really highlight uh, as a reason for this, their success, and that is failures. So talk about some of the things, some of the paths that you've gone down that may not have turned out the way that you thought they would, but the lessons learned were invaluable. Yeah, so I have one, a perfect story for, for this, but I think this is a great question to ask, and I always wonder why not, not many people ask. They feel like it's a taboo to talk about it. And I think that's like a bit of a social paradigm that I don't agree with because I think that it's through your failures that we grow. That's your the, the cornerstones of your character. And that's what allows you to, well, it depends. You can either, you know, go backwards from, it's how you, uh, how it occurs to you and how you, how you transform from it. But so I got a, a great story of failure. And so after my tenure in the Marine Corps, I had, I had uh, saved a lot of money because I did President Bush's security and embassy duty. And at that, you just live in the embassy compounds and all of your revenue, all, all of your income comes in, but you don't have to spend any of it. So I bought, that's why it moved, moved me here. I bought properties here and I went to school at USF and I was at school and I was thinking, well, what business do I want to start? And I got this idea, I don't know why, but to do to, to do not a, a party bus, but not like a party bus like uh, for, for drinking in clubs, but one for like weddings and special events. And, uh, but it was gonna be built around a night, a, a Bristol deck of the bus, like a London double-decker bus that was done, you know, very um, eloquently. And that would, you know, be able to take people for weddings and it had a second floor. So there's, I just had all this. So I, uh, you know, got obsessed about it while I was at school. And then I found this brick of the, this bus, um, uh, 1965 brick of the deck, a double-decker bus. This is a 42,000 pound bus that's 17 feet tall and 30 foot long and it has air over hydraulic brake, brakes. And I found it in Cupertino, um, California, right, right at, literally outside the headquarters, right next to the headquarters of Apple. And I was, I was, so I'm going to buy this thing to bring it here to convert it into this party bus. And I um, called the person and said, hey, can I, can I get the measurements? I get the measurements and I find, because of how high it is, it, you could never get the thing towed because it would, it would hit every stoplight or every bridge. <laughs> You couldn't put it on a ship because it doesn't fit into any type of container. You just have to put it open on. So I said, well, what's my only option is to drive it. So I bought a plane ticket and I flew to, to California. And you gotta remember 1965, this thing is 1965. I don't know why I thought that it was gonna be able to, but, and so I bought this thing and I drove it and it has no power steering. And it's, you're oh driving God. on the right side of the road and you shift with your left hand. And it's like a truck driver. I'd never driven, it was a nine speed. And I, I ended up, I, I think I lost like 22 pounds, but it took me seven days to do it. And I would sleep in the back. I could, I could, I would have to skip gas stations. It had air, all this, it was like the craziest road trip of my life 
And throughout this, I'm like, what did I get myself into? Only to get back to, I did make it back. So I guess that was a win, but the failure was that I got, I, I got back and I didn't um, have enough money to finish the project. And so what did I realize? I realized I put myself in this situation to where I invested all this money that I had saved and I was in a good financial situation and I let myself go to the bottom. And it was because I applied something that I learned in, in the Marine Corps and I applied something that I got from being Latino, which is I'm very passionate <laughs> and, and, and like cabeza duro. And it's like what I want, I want. But what I didn't do was that I didn't, I didn't build out a budget and plan at well enough in advance in order to make sure that I wasn't just shooting from the hip and I ended up, you know, losing 40 something thousand dollars. Um, it took me three years to sell it eventually for 20 grand. And so I lost 20 something, but what I gained, it was a great education because I gained the, the understanding of how important it, is, important it is to take massive action. I still believe that that's crucial. A lot of people take, don't take action, but, but you must, um, invest the energy to to really think it out and get it on paper and really understand what you're what you're going to invest your time and your energy and your passion in. Yeah, there you go. That's perfect. You know, you you have to have a grand idea and you have to have the passion to follow it, but you got to think it through as well. But yep. you know what? Hey, that's better. I thought you were going to say you left it in Arizona or something. So. I know that would have been bad. Yeah, and the, the police don't know about it, but it's just I've been in a vehicle <laughs> somewhere out there. I don't know. Yeah, no. we made know. it. The okay, person, so, wait, can I say one last thing? Because this is funny. Sure. But the person who bought it for me, ironically, was in California. And oh, um, okay. when when he called me and he said, hey, well, so how, how would I get? I said, look, you're not going to be able to get on a train. You're not going to be able to. There's, I, there's no way. You just have to drive it. And he's like, okay, did you drive it? And I was like, yeah, I drove it by myself um, coming back. But it's it's not easy. And he's like, okay, well, I'll come with my friend. And so he only he made it to Crystal River. And then he parked it. And then he went home for three weeks. And then he brought nine other people. And they all would switch. They could only do two hours of driving at a time. I'm, this oh, thing has no power, no air conditioning, no power. Yeah. So, oh my gosh, yeah. but it made it all the way back across the country. But he only made it an hour away and you made it all the way. That <laughs> yeah. got, so that you got a little tenacity there. That's for sure. Yeah. That's great. That's awesome. So are you from Peru orig originally? No, I'm originally from New Hampshire, but my family's okay. from Peru. Okay. Excellent. And uh, how did you find your way to Tampa? It was to, after you got out of the military, you bought property here and then decided to go to USF or it was USF and then property? No, it was property first. So okay. I, you know, the weather was a, a big okay. attractor, like a lot of people for me. And I had researched, I mean, I wish I had a, uh, an amazing story, you know, about some real strong connection, but it was really that I had looked and saw what areas where there was most speculation. And I saw, wow, there's huge opportunities you could buy. Like at the and in 2011, I was buying, properties for like $20,000 a door. And it just was like, it made so much, it made a lot of sense for me. And so I figured that, and they were all in downtown St. Pete and I was, there was a school there and it made sense for me to get my education there. So that's what brought me to the area. And, but the area kept me here. Boy, I tell you, so I was a police officer started in 1984 and, you know, phone, I had purchased the property and been as, as insightful as you. I say now, if I had only invested in Zoom and Peloton, who, you know, who knows? Right, what, yeah. <laughs> would Hindsight be right. is definitely a great vision, right? 2020. Okay, there you go. So that was your, was was the bus the beginning of your entrepreneurship or, or do you consider the purchasing of the property? And do you still do that? Um, I know right now I'm fully vested in what I do. I, I, I think singular focus. That's one thing I gained from that bus experience is hyper focus and, um, and, and due diligence. So it was a strong thing. But I mean, I started when I was 15, I, I started a ice cream truck because I, I was like this pre, pre diabetic kid who was just always wanting sugar. <laughs> and I saw a TV show and I'm like, I've never seen an ice cream truck. The depravity, <laughs> like I need to fix this problem. This is a serious problem. And so then I did that. I was making, you know, anywhere from 500 to $5,000 a day as a 14 year old. And, and it was like, I got a bug and it was, you know, yeah, it was, it was, you know, buying whatever I wanted and I was able to, and it was all because I saw a problem and then I solved it. And so that gave me the idea that, you know, if you take massive action. And so I went into the Marine Corps as a massive, I'm going to go do this. And that, that helped me. I got into embassy duty, but you you have to think things through. So, it, you know, I, it, that, that failure, was felt really i mean it, it damaged my credit it damaged my my belief in myself it all these things that are ultimately 
you know, belief in yourself is the most important one, right? And so I was like, am I really that good? Or was I lucky when I was 14, you know? And so, and, but then, you know, I was able to rebound from it and build something. And I think that, that, that ultimately, I would never take that experience back. Mm-hmm. No kidding. That, and I think a lot of us would say that too about, uh, about failures and mistakes. Uh, you learn so much. So as a former police officer, I probably shouldn't ask this question, but if you bought the ice cream truck at 14, who was driving it? Yeah, so this is a good, so this is this is wonderful. Um, so it's actually kind of funny. So what happened was that I call, I found this ice cream truck place on in the yellow books back then. I'm telling how old I am, you know, but, um, and I found this in Massachusetts, like three and a half hours away. So I call this, this, this guy on the phone and he's talking to me about how it works and you rent the ice cream truck for some price during the day. And then after that, you buy the ice cream and for like 35 cents and you sell it for $3. And I'm like, oh, this sounds amazing. And so then he says, okay, let me get your credit card. And I'm like, credit card, I'm only 14. And he was so upset. I said, well, we'll relax. There's, we can, there's a, there's a solution to this. And he says, I said, how old do I need to be? He's like, call me in four years. And I said, well, I'm going to call you tomorrow. So I had a neighbor who was 18 years old, who his parents hated him because he didn't have a job and he dropped out of school. And I was like, look, you got a problem. I got a problem. Let me take you to the city. You're going to take the Hawker pedals license. I'm going to give you a hundred dollars a day. And you're just going to drive this truck. And ah, then, look at that. Yeah. So I gave him like $500 a week, which was like huge for him. And then I was able to make obviously a lot more than that because it was my idea yeah wow that is incredible at 14 years old my goodness i'm gonna go home my kids are 21 i don't think together they've had an idea like that yet so (laughs) (laughs) but mine was driven by my 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 mom you know we come from you know single mother she was working three jobs all the time and i mean when i was eight i wrote a letter to the president saying like why can't i get a job i need to help take care of my mom you know i've always been you know like just always like I, when I was 12, I got had the school had to get me because I was found out we didn't have oil for the house. And so I just got the diesel fuel from the street. But then I smelled like oil and the school's like, this kid can't be here. It smells like oil. And so it was like there was a strong ambition because I saw like, you know, I want to be there for for her. And then, you know, that's so it's a driver. And I think that a lot of Latinos have that same situation. Yeah. Like we all have to like, you know, take care of our family. It's like in, built into our. You know, yeah. And then crowd work. Yeah, yeah, right. Strong sense of uh, family and and very strong work ethic too. So let's talk about uh, Emertech. How did you start it? Like, uh, this is going to be fascinating as well. Yeah. So this my first first of all, my co-founder started it. He built the technology, and I focus on people. So that's one of the things that I I learned from my mother. I I you know more. I'm not you know it's, you know how they say it's just business. There's no emotions. I think that's that's not true at all. I think there's only emotions, and you have to understand them and and develop relationships. And so I think more about people and less than the product. And so I met someone with a great EQ, an extraordinary developer, um, super complimentary, right? Doesn't I'm counting business. Go go get it done. And he's like calculative tech um, coder. Um, and he had a product that that um, that he was developing for virtual reality, and um, we started to I started to learn more about him what it was, and I believe that it was the next computing medium with him. But I also, you know, once once you see who's investing in in this space, VR and AR, you see that they're the same people that developed the computers, the internet, and and uh, cell phone in, mm-hmm. industries. And so then you can just look at those historically and see kind of what happened. Again, going back to doing my research because I don't want to get burned on another bus. And I did really extensive research and then I came to across a World Health Organization um, article that said 5 billion people on the planet don't have access to safe and affordable surgery. And that's going to lead to 19 times more death than AIDS and tuberculosis combined. So I said, wow, here's a serious problem that, you know, according to the World Health, we need to double the amount of physicians we have by 2030, by 2030 for the world. It's like, how is that possible? And it's only possible if you increase access to unique procedures and devices. And I saw virtual reality as a way to, to bridge that gap through this innovative technology. And so we built a platform that allows surgeons from anywhere in the country and eventually the world to put on a VR headset, to look to the right, to the left, and see everything as if they're in that operating room in person. They can manipulate feeds. They can really just have that real experience, communicate back and forth with with the surgeon so that he or she can teach them how to do um, this unique procedure so that they can provide that value for people in rural Kentucky or Mississippi or eventually Rwanda and Lima. Mm -hmm. So that was like the passion that that you know built us towards where we are today. So it's a it's a learning tool to teach physicians how and is it specific to uh, operations or other techniques as well? I mean, is specific to surgery? 
but for right now we're specific to product. So we, um, and like any business, you need to find a business model that makes sense. You have to find a customer that you're providing a lot of value that will pay for all of this. And so our current customer is industry. So that's medical device manufacturers. And um, uh, they they use our technology to develop and to train surgeons on how to use their devices. But eventually we plan to, you know, it'll be other procedures outside of that as the product scales and we see other, you know, methods. But our hyper focus right now is specific to procedures for devices, unique devices and procedures. That is, that's, um, that really is uh, incredible. And the virtual uh, market is is really going to take off in, in training in general, not, you know, not only associated with uh, medical equipment or I know when I retired from the police department in 2015, that's one of the, the areas everybody uh, always talks about. Well, you know, they, the officers need more training, need more training. Well, if you trained on everything they did, they'd be in training 24 hours a day. And you, it's a scheduling issue too. So there's a lot of uh, talk. It hasn't taken off that, maybe that'll be your next idea. Yeah. It hasn't taken off in law enforcement yet uh, to the degree that, that I thought it would but using the virtual training as well. So you could have officers that were on midnight shift, they can come in, put on the goggles and, and have the virtual uh, training that it really is as realistic as you can get without you know being the hands-on in the room training. Well, that's what you what you just explained is exact. I'm not a police officer, but I was in the Marine Corps and I did spend a year in combat in Iraq. And I'll tell you, you know, I did a lot of repetitive action and I was there was a lot of, of, of artificial stress that was simulated in the Marine Corps, but it was all created for one reason. So that, you know, 37 minutes during combat that, that in, in, in one area that I would I would react and I would perform. So it's like in, it's a group providing exposure. And so the op- surgeons are, are just like um, uh, police officers and military in the sense that when you get in that room somebody's life's on the line yeah if you don't perform if you just shut down if you close down and you don't perform to muscle memory or to to being able to be present in that moment for a long period of time I mean, we can't be present this 30 minute i bet some people are going to leave because it's difficult yeah. to be present for 37 minutes some surgeries are eight hours long so they really need that exposure but yeah, next no doubt military yep. police there's plenty of areas and they're right. There's so many areas that you don't get a second chance. Yep. You know, you're you're there, and and a lot of times um, you don't get to to determine when that moment is. Right. You, you have no idea. You could walk into a room and be involved in a life or death situation. So that is um, that is incredible. So we talked about your Hispanic heritage and how that uh, has played a role in your success. But can you expand on that? a little bit and um you know just what what uniqueness do you think that that has brought to you as a person as a business uh um executive and you know in in your life in general so i mean one is that i was uh, being latino my mother was super affectionate cariñosa with me and the way that i was raised and so i have a lot of love to share because i've only come from a place of love and so it sounds weird when I'm telling you how is that going to be successful for your business, but it's it's a hard thing because when you look for to you want to create a big software company, you think, okay, how do I become Mark Zuckerberg, right? But the thing is, is that sometimes you can focus on like, well, what are my strengths, my unique strengths? If you're able to connect with other human beings, how can you leverage that skill set and forget about you know that whatever specific thing that gives Mark Zuckerberg the the you know this his advantage, right? And 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 so I think that I've um, really connected with my roots and understanding what that is. And I look everybody on my, on my, I call them, I'm employee number one. If you look at every social media, it's servant leader. I believe that I'm here to serve everyone else. And that is part of my culture. Yeah. I believe that um, I'm only here. I'm on the, I'm on the shoulders of, of giants. I honestly believe this. Every person in my company owns shares. They're a partner. And I say, when I, when I, when I, bring on anyone on our team, I say, look, three things matter to me. I want to make sure that your career, whatever your career goals are, are, are met, that this is that that I make this a fun ride, that at any point, if you no longer feel this is fun, please let me know because I need to change it because I'm Latino and we like to have parties all, all month, like, uh, like Jane Caster says, right? And then three is that I'm, there's no prouder moment than when I write you this check at the end. 
because you deserve it because you're building your company and then whatever you do with that and however that changes your life right however you decide to pass that forward right that is the that's that's my juice and that's what keeps me going that my my me saying that i can say that authentically because and i believe it's because i'm latino it's because of the way that i was raised right we're cheesy we're corny i watch telenovelas my whole life and it's like everybody's like dating the other person's cousin and it's like Ay, mi alma, mi you know <laughs> but yeah it's perfect you know and that that um that really sums it up too that's that, i feel that way as well uh, although my spanish i have my partner's uh hispanic so maybe that's good but yeah. um, the same thing. You feel with, it. You know that. You, yeah, you know that. Right? I definitely know it. And yeah. uh, you know, it is true that that servant's heart that is so important. And having a passion for what you do. You, know, you talked about um, maybe having a goal of being the next Mark Zuckerberg, but really, it's it's having that passion for what you do, engaging your success by that, not by somebody else's uh, standard. And I've heard a lot of people talk about you know, since the this pandemic has hit and they've had to stay at home, that there's been a lot of reevaluation and and not so much of a focus on the material, but on those family values and on those personal values that, you know, what is gonna be the difference? What what mark are you gonna leave uh, in this world? And it's it's not necessarily the bank account or the material things. It's it's what you have done for your community or uh, for others as well. So that's that really is incredibly important. And I think those are are, uh, are definitely words to live by. So what is next for your company? What's the future? A lot is next for us. It's really exciting because of um, all that's going on in the current climate, as you could imagine, remote training throughout without the risk of infection, you know, hospitals not needing to to spend on PPE and PPE waste that keeps us super busy trying to help these these hospitals and these device continue to train and continue to to do to do the things that they're they're built to do right without causing increasing the risk of infection and causing causing more pain so that has us growing really fast and so we've we've um we're expanding our team bringing in you know talent from from other areas and also bringing talent from here that finding local talent as well and so um, that's really exciting and you know this team that we're building out right now will have us go from 100 ORs by the end of this year to a thousand operating rooms where we'll be allowing surgeons from all over the country and, and, and probably by the end of the year all over the world to remote in and observe from John Hopkins and all these different like really centers of excellence and that is super motivating to me that's like yeah. what allows you to push on every I haven't taken a weekend off every Saturday and Sunday working full days you know, um, and it's because I know what what I'm doing right now is worth it, even if I fail. Right. It's it's right. absolutely worth it. And so you get to grow every day, everybody, yep. leadership, all this stuff. So it's just exciting. The future is bright. You know, it's it's definitely a, a path that's going to take a lot of work and a lot of courage to push past a lot of um, uh, overworking, a little stress, things like that. But it's worth it. It's worth it for yeah. sure. Got to remember to take a little bit of time for yourself. But it is difficult when you're, you know, you know what you're doing ultimately can save lives. So, you know, it's difficult to. Uh, yeah. It's also to difficult them. when your patterns come from Latinos. My mother. Yeah. You, uh, what time did she take for herself? You know, working three jobs uh, like every day in the morning. I remember going even working at night, sleeping four hours. And I was just like, how is this possible? Well, right. that set an example for me, understanding that, like when you care about the people that are around you and you care about what you're doing, then you know you push yourself past those lines you know and so mm -hmm. but I, I don't know if it's actually healthy though <laughs> i gotta talk to my mom hey, hey that example it's worked in some ways but no but i'm ultimately excellent. i have a very positive view so excellent that's great well this has absolutely been fascinating eric and i hope that um before long i'll be able to come over to your headquarters and yeah, see all, to share the, all of the different offices and and uh how they're painted and also look at um look at um, the product and, helps it. and meet our culture. By the way, I say this one last thing, if I may, oh, sure. one thing I'm very proud of in light of a lot of the things that are happening, by the way, great first year as a mayor, oh, there's a lot <laughs> that's been going on for you and you're managing very well. So that's kudos to you. I bet that you haven't slept very much either um, making, making this happen. But um, one of the things is that even before COVID, our culture was 68% minority of, of, and, wow. And um, we continue to, 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 to be well above 50% in, in, in minority, even as we grow our team. And it's, and it's uh, 
by creation. Like you have to believe it's because we understand that, you know, I personally believe we're all patterns of behavior that we've learned and, and a lot of it is subconscious. And so, you know, having this diversity allows you to, to see things. And I mean, you just have much better vision of a path to success in my opinion, right? So many different patterns. And once you start to understand people and, and appreciate them for who they really are, then you can make extraordinary things happen by having a diverse, you know, uh, group. And so I'm excited to, like I said, if you're open to it, I understand you're a very busy person. So one day. Oh, no, no, trust me, I'll be there. Yeah, it's very, very exciting. And that, that uh, as well, you know, you're, you're singing my, my tune there too with, uh, with diversity and the importance of that, especially the field that I came from and, and the position that I'm in right now. I, I do believe that we are all a sum total of our life experiences. And those experiences have to be around the table when decisions are being made. You know, we have to ensure that that we are inclusive. And and as you stated too, that um, you know we're we're learning so much about, I believe, perception. We are going to learn so much about, but um, you know that that individuals have not been included uh, throughout our history, and it, it really is time that that everyone one takes a look inside themselves to to look at those biases that you may have and to ensure that you know you're you're opening up the door to everyone so that everyone has that opportunity i um i went to the university of tampa on an athletic scholarship i always tell everybody you know when you're six foot tall in the second grade and you grow up around all boys their sports in your future but i went to university of tampa on a full athletic scholarship and and my family had no money for an education, valued education, but no money for that. So that was the key that opened the door of every opportunity I've ever had. And, and someone took a chance on me. And that was something that, that um, I, I certainly recognized and I made a promise then that I would provide that opportunity for as many people as I possibly could. And I tell you what, that's all people need is a chance because the vast majority, they have the, they have the capabilities, they have the intellect, they have the motivation, they have, they have what it takes, they just need that chance. So I applaud you personally, uh, your company and what you're doing for uh, the diversity of our community. It really is great. So thank you so much. All right, this has been a great show. Uh, now I'm just, I don't know, I'm so motivated. We're having the budget hearing this evening, so that's gonna bring me back down. But thank you so much and uh, nothing but the best, although I'm sure you don't need it for uh, your company in the future. And then to everybody out there, listen to what Eric said. Don't be held back by the what ifs. You know, if you got a dream, you have to go out there. And if you, you get knocked down, get back up and learn from the mistakes, learn from the failures and apply that uh, to your future success. So uh, here's to all the entrepreneurs out there. Here's to everyone who has the, the, um, the, the desire and the belief uh, in themselves to, to take that chance. You will be successful. Now I have to remind everybody, we are coming down to the end of the census. It is critically important that you take that census and make sure that everyone in your household is counted. As I've told you many, many times, it only took me five minutes the tech, probably the most uh, technologically challenged person on this earth. I took it, I took it in less than five minutes. So make sure you get in that census, get counted because our representation in Washington uh, depends on it. And just as importantly, our funding here in this city uh, depends on it. So make sure you take the census and that you are counted. And lastly, wear your mask, wash your hands, stay six feet away from others, and be safe. And above all else, stay healthy and stay kind. Thanks, Eric. Take care. Great meeting you. All right, bye-bye.